Well, hey neighbor, we are talking about sweet corn today. We've got our buddy Peter here and it's time to plant sweet corn. So we thought, what a better show to let's talk about sweet corn and give you some options on what variety you should plant. Well, it's been a little while, Peter. Glad to have you back. Glad to be here, yep. as always. Oh, sweet corn. Love our sweet corn, don't Love we? It, man. Yeah, and uh, a lot of people out there may may not be aware of some of these varieties we're going to talk about today. We're going to give you some options, maybe give you some information you didn't know on sweet corn. But first of all, let's talk about what's going on in the garden. I've got my greenhouse bumping with plants right now. It's that time of the year. Mm -hmm. What about you? Uh, we're just starting to sow. So yep. this, uh, pepper went in last week. Uh, tomatoes will be sowed into this week. I'm not doing as much this year because I'm converting my garden to a flower garden. We've got a wedding coming up. My son's getting married. So I'm putting a lot of flowers in the garden this year, which is different for me. We're going to try it. So you're doing a wedding theme garden. Well, I'm doing uh, flowers that could be used at the wedding. Yeah, zinnias, a um, couple other things, cosmos, got some seed from y'all. And I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to try sunflowers, never grown sunflowers. Some of it's for nematode control. It's going to be a side benefit, I hope. Yep. So the, the sunflowers is going to be a timing thing. If you can pull that off, you'll have perfect, but those can be a little tricky. Yeah, I'm going to do multiple plantings and yep. see what happens. But you know, it's interesting. A lot of people are doing wedding gardens nowadays. I mean, they plant in their garden around the wedding, which is, is kind of neat there. Well, get, you know, give them cost of flowers and, and tabletop bouquets and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. And it, you know, uh, it's going to be an outdoor wedding. So uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm, I'm excited about it in a way. I've never done an only a flower only garden so and you know you've mentioned before you have a lot of problems with nematodes Dude, in your garden yeah, so this is going to it's going to help starve them out a little bit give some rotation there yeah that and and the fact that i'll be done early enough i'm gonna i'm gonna attempt to solarize the garden in august mm -hmm. so uh, the wedding's in july i'm hoping sometime in mid-august i'll get everything out of there uh till it solarize it and and in addition to all the 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 flowers in there i'm gonna try to do a, a pretty aggressive solarization in there you know, we talked about a little bit earlier, there's a lot of work being done on peppers as far as nematode resistant mm -hmm. varieties on peppers, which is interesting. Yeah, it's existing in tomatoes for a while. People have had that option for a while. It's not as widely uh, distributed in germplasm for tomatoes, I mean for peppers, but we're getting there and uh, as we get closer and, and are able to, to really articulate that to, to home gardeners in particular fighting a problem like nematodes, there'll be a nice one-two punch being able to put a solanum crop like a pepper or a tomato out there to take care of uh, a problem like nematodes. Yeah, I, I mentioned to you earlier, you need to be working on the okra uh, nematode yeah. resistant yeah. crop. <laughs> don't, don't hold your breath, don't hold your breath. Okras are our, uh, it's probably our worst crop for nematodes around here, it's horrible. Yeah, I do think we're getting close to a point though where if, you, if you've got enough, a scale enough of a garden you plant a year ahead, you can mm -hmm. put your okra in a spot where you had a nematode resistant product or variety the year before. And control it. And at least get much more productivity out of your okra for right. longer. Yeah. All right, so we've got a couple things we've got to cover first before we get into the sweet corn, but the sweet corn thing's gonna be good. Turmeric, we got pre-order on turmeric. You ever grown turmeric before? I'm not. We got turmeric uh, available, so that's gonna be shipping around the March 15th. Sweet potatoes pre-orders, we got those. If you ain't ordered your sweet potatoes, go on there and get that done. And we've got some Tom multiplying onions. If they're not sold out, we dug a few this week. So check it out if you want some of the Toms. I know a lot of you've been waiting on the uh, Tom multiplying onions and we got a limited supply. So check that out if you hadn't already bought them. And we have got, oh, one more thing, plants. We're gonna have pepper plants and tomato plants, we hope the second week in March, somewhere around the 8th to the 13th there. You know how live plants are. It's hard for me to tell you exactly because they are live plants. We've got to roll them out. But it's looking like we're going to have them available around the um, the 13th, maybe the 8th night, somewhere in there. So we got the uh, Halsinator bell pepper, jalapeno pepper, we got banana pepper, we got some good tomatoes there. But folks, we have got knife of the week. It's a little segment we started doing a, a few weeks ago. And Peter, I know you love knives like I do. I do. That's a nice one. Yep. This here, folks, and this is the usual, so don't judge the looks of it here. This is an S-E-S-E-E. -E -E. And this is a brand I probably wanted to, when I got into knives real heavy, this is probably the brand I got into first. It's a great value knife right there. Most of their knives are 1095 carbon steel. 
but they starting they starting to get into some more steels. But the older knives were all 1095, which made them very affordable. Made in the USA, which is important. But it's more of a camping knife. I, Pete, me personally, I don't like a spine that thick for skin knife. I agree. I agree. But this I, is more of an outdoor knife. Yeah, I think it's marketed more of a yeah a trail knife stuff like that. Camp, right. camping knife. Great value on these things right here, made in the USA. And this particular one, most of them come with Kydex sheaths. This one does as well there. So if you check SC knives out, if you're interested in fixed blades, I don't think they do a folder, but they got several different models, all the way from little bitty knives up to the six. I've actually got one of their six inch knives. So SC, what is uh, what's your favorite brand? Uh, probably uh, Cold Steel. Really? Yeah. I find that interesting. Yeah, I uh, had a Cold Steel Master Hunter when I was in college, and uh, it's my been my favorite. It's probably my favorite overall knife. Huh. Particularly for hunting purposes. They've been around for a long time. They're based out of California, though. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> we can hold that against them. <laughs> yeah, still a good. They got good products. Yeah, they uh, do, and they're affordable too. That's what generally speaking. Product, yeah. yeah, yeah, they got some. Uh, probably have half a dozen of their stuff. Why would you want to grow sweet corn? Well, sweet corn is one of those is one of those that are actually delicious, but they're not the easiest to grow. But man, I don't know how you don't grow it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's fun to grow. It's one of those things to me. I love going out there in the garden when it gets about knee tight and you've, got, you've just fertilized it, you get a good rain, you can actually hear it popping and growing out in the garden. Uh -huh. It's one of the, it's one of the uh, great joys of gardening I get to grow in corn. Now, corn's not the easiest thing to grow, but it can be extremely rewarding. And what I like about sweet corn is we put it up in the freezer and we have something to eat on all year long. Now, everybody's got their way putting up corn. Yep. What do, how do y'all do it? Ours is pretty straightforward. We just uh, blanch it on the ear, cut it off, freeze it. How do y'all cut it off? One of those gizmos or y'all cut it off with knives? Pretty much with knives. You had a bowl. Pretty straightforward. So my wife comes from a long line of people that lived out. I, I don't know. How, I'm not going to call them homesteaders because they was just raised right out in the boonies. And they got their way of doing things and they're going to do it that way. They've done it that way for the uh -huh. last 50 years. They're going to they cut every bit off with a knife and then they're going to scrape it. They don't want none of these fancy gizmos like you stick it into PVC with the blades around there and anything. They're going to do it the same way regardless. Now, they want a good sharp knife, but they cream it off yep. and, then, and then blanch it and then put it up. Cream corn. We don't ever put corn on the cob. Very common in the mountains. Where Is it? Yep. yep. We used, to, used to see a lot of that up there. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty, pretty much the way they do it up there. Do y'all put any up on the cob? We don't. I've done it over the years. Uh, it just takes up too much room. Well, that's that's the biggest part of yeah. it. And then if you're going to serve it at um, functions, Thanksgiving or whatever right. family function, uh, corn on the cob is generally a just blanch it and eat it type yeah. thing. Particularly yeah. with the genetics now, they're so they're so good. Right. I don't care for frozen corn on the cob. I like it fresh. That's just me. All right. So it's a good food source. You can keep it on. Now the, the downside is that when it gets red, you got a small window there to harvest it and put it up. So it's not one of those things like pumpkins or sweet potatoes, you know, that you can put out there and, and, and have it uh, for a long period of time without any refrigeration. You got to have refrigeration. Now you can't can it. Yep. We don't do any of that. I wish she's done a little bit of it. We don't do a lot of the canning of the corn. Do y'all do any of that? We don't, but I mean, obviously, us as a business, I mean, the, the canned corn business is a huge processing business for us. And you was telling me what varieties are mostly, if you go buy canned corn, sweet corn, what variety is that? It's almost all SU1 stuff or SEs, but okay. mostly SU1 because everything in that industry is about cut recovery. Uh, they want real depth of kernel. I mean, anyone, anyone who's eaten a can of corn, it's a huge kernel generally. It's uh, usually got either the bottom attached to it where it attached to the cob or something wow. like that. And everything in that business is measured about cut recovery. Very different than how we measure yield on the fresh market side or the home garden side. Right. Most of what I use for is fish bait. Yep. Can corn. <laughs> Catch trout with it. Yep. All right. Now, corn can be difficult to grow, but once you get the hang of it, it's kind of like riding a bike. Once you get the hang of it, you can kind of run with it. But for the beginner gardener, I find that sometimes I have trouble with this right here. And one reason why is fertility. Corn loves fertility, it loves water, and you can't stress it at certain times. You really got to be proactive about having everything just right for it. On these newer varieties, it's even more important. True. 
but you got to have everything just right when it needs it pop it to it and move on if you go on vacation or you slip a little bit and you stress that point at a certain corner at a certain point you can cause yourself some issues yeah and one of the things about sweet corn though it can be if you're going to double crop it in your garden that extra fertility you put in just goes to the next crop so right you don't, or, need, you don't need to be so concerned about it sure and or, or it works great in rotation too well it's it's one of its main values for particularly a medium to small grower is what it what it does in rotation right uh one of the the drawbacks for it is it takes a good bit of air you need to plant it in, in five or six or seven foot i mean seven rows there where you can get pollination because corn is pollinated by the wind not by insects so you got to have a decent little block of it so it pollinates well you don't want to plant in those long rows no. two or three you want to plant them in those blocks so it can get pollinated and you have it so a lot of people don't have that much room us living out in the rural area we have enough room we always love growing corn as far as pests go there's not a lot there the biggest pest we have here in the south is corn earworm yeah and you was mentioning y'all have stink bug problems well we do have stink bug problems taking commercial side but uh, large scale but stink bugs are a very significant problem in the, in the carolinas right now right they uh the way they attack sweet corn is they pierce to the side of the ear when it's, do when they it's, leave a mark and don't get like a domain? The kernels will die. The, you'll have you'll uh, shuck an ear back and there'll be a brown kernel here or there and you can almost guarantee it will stink bug damage. Okay. Well, with the corn earworm down here, we uh, treat with spinosad over the top there. You can possibly use uh, bug buster, regular, regular bug buster go over the top. We've had some decent results with that. But the main thing is if you plant your corn early, you can minimize your corn earworm problem most of the time not every year but sometimes uh we have more problems than we do other years but planting it early in the springtime seems to minimize our corn earworm here in georgia how about y'all does that make a difference in North it Carolina? does make a difference because the flights build up during the course of the summer if you're in an area where your local extension office is uh putting out light traps uh -huh. uh, nowadays particularly with the online resources if you can find that hour master gardener program they have light uh light traps you can actually um, see what the flights are doing and how the trap counts are going. But yes, for us, the June flight and July flight of corn earworms are the worst. That's the reason if you plant fall sweet corn down here, you really got to manage those, those corn earworms a lot more than you do in the springtime. Yeah, fall down here and in North Carolina, army worms become a, yep. a threat that's not there in the spring. Right. And uh, if you get an ear, it's got a worm in it, just cut it out. I'm going to just go fishing. Growing up, that's yeah. what that was. After we did creek corn, we went fishing because oh, we had really? all the worms. In I ain't thought about we would that. We have a separate bucket. Yep. We put the worms in. Yep, yep. A lot of people don't get that, but we just—I mean, if you did get an ear and you got you got a worm in there, just cut it out. Just cut it out. Just cut it out and keep on going. It's not the end of the world. All right, so let's get into what varieties you should grow. Because look here, folks. I guarantee you, your granddaddy, or grandfather, or great granddaddy had a variety that he was tickled about, and he won't grow anything else. I've seen this time and time again. Well, we've grown Silver Queen for years and years, and that's all I'm going to grow. There's some good old varieties out there, but folks, i got to tell you right now, there's a lot better varieties out there than they used to be. People still going trucker's favorite, hard yep. to believe. So, of the heirlooms, now, the only heirloom that we carry is Stoll's Evergreen, but True Gold is another one. Do you remember that one, True I, Gold? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. G90 and Silver Queen are the two that I'm still see occasionally right and the golden cross bantam was a uh was one i've never i've never grown that but i've seen it in doing some research that was a variety that you come across a lot of people you grew way back in the day so let's start out with what we call the sh standard sugar which is you see su and if you go to our website and you search down on corns we got these things broke out in these different types right here so you can see what i'm talking about here and we're going to put it on the screen as we go along here too all right Standard sugar, SU, is the oldest type of sweet corn. Yep. Less storage, but more forgiving to grow. Some varieties that you mentioned there, there's going to be Stoll's Evergreen, Silver Queen, G90, and Sugar Buns. Yeah, and, and they're also the quickest to convert to starch. Mm -hmm. So your, your, your period of, of, of high eating quality or good eating quality is relatively short. I think the, the consensus, based on kind of modern genetics as you you better process it or eat it the day you pick it so a long time ago that's the only variety that, that my wife's family would grow silver queen nothing else and that when we started we got married started growing a garden back in the early 20s i mean when we was 20s not in the early 20s mm -hmm. 
We grew silver queen. I grew silver queen for years. It yeah. silks pretty good. Yep. It's a good eating corn if you eat it fresh. It's late by modern standards. Right. And uh, we would put it up, but what we would do, we would gather it that morning, and we would cut it off that day. Did it all in one day's time. Pretty decent corn. Yeah. It's, it's uh, in North Carolina, if you go to the farmer's markets, most of the time you'll see silver queen, but it's not silver queen. Oh, it's not. It's become a, kind of like a generic name for white sweet corn. Right. Very, right. very little commercial guys, even smaller guys, farm market guys, grow Silver Queen. We're seeing a lot of people transition away from it. So that being said, I understand your heritage with that, but as we go along here, keep in mind, we're starting off with these issues and we're going to move through and we're going to give you some rides that we think are a lot better to grow. So let's move on to what we call sugary enhanced. And this is going to be the S-U, excuse me, S-E. Now these contain more sugars than the starchy type ones that we just mm -hmm. talked about here and are able to retain their sweetness for two to four days with proper refrigeration, less hardy than the SU types. It is also a more tender kernel and does not lend itself to mechanical handling. Now these are the varieties we fish to give you. Does not require isolation from SU pollen, although it's preferred. So what we're saying here, folks, is you can plant these SEs next to an SU and they won't cross pollinate. Now, in my opinion, somebody that's just now growing corn for the first time ever, they probably want to start out with some of these SUs. They're more forgiving to grow. I would certainly start out with them before I started with an SU one. Right. But they're not going to be as good a corn, but they're definitely going to be more forgiving. Once we move into the sugar enhanced ones, uh, they're going to be a better corn. Let's give you some examples of those peaches and cream. Yeah. Whoever named Peaches and Cream did a wonderful Still job. Genius, yeah. Yeah. Peaches and Cream, Ambrosia, Bodacious, Silver King. I grew Silver King a couple of years, wasn't really impressed with it. It's late again, it's late by modern standards. Right. It's it's a, at least a week later than a lot of things that would be grown in place of it. Incredible. Yeah. Candy corn, which is great very name. <laughs> great name. And a lot of people love their candy corn and Argent, which is a less known variety, Argent. That's a white, correct? It's a white. Yep. Used to see it a little bit up in North Carolina. So we have those right there that are able to retain their sweetness for two to four days, unlike those SU varieties that you pretty much have to harvest and eat. So we got those. Now, as we go down the variety here, we see these name recognition comes up on these varieties that we recommend, uh, that we remember more back in the day. As we get in these, these newer varieties, you don't recognize the name quite as much, but they're, in our opinion, better corns. All right, let's move on into the super sweets that you got a lot of information yep. you can uh, you can share on this right here. These are what we call the SH2s. And I'll let you talk about those for a little bit. Well, I mean, the SH2s are now the, and have been probably for the last, probably 20 years plus now, the most widely grown, really the only grown genetic type for commercial shipping, mm -hmm. the type you see at a grocery store. So right here where you are in Georgia, I mean, we're just up the road, right. and, and that field had sweet corn in it twice last year, both times is super sweets. So, uh, if you buy corn at a grocery store, if you buy it in a tray, uh, if you buy it anywhere year-round is in the U.S. in a grocery store, it's a super sweet. Um, from a home gardener's perspective, probably the biggest value of it is that it gives you tremendous flexibility on when you harvest it. Um, you know, if you're gonna, if you know you're gonna um, pick corn on or put up corn on Saturday, but it's gonna be a rain on Saturday, you can pick a super sweet on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and it's going to be the exact same on Saturday as it was on Tuesday or Wednesday. They have no conversion to starch. Unlike the Silver Queens of the Unlike world. Unlike the Silver Queens of the world. That, that's why they are so ubiquitous in the shipping trade is they are built to handle you know, harvest, distribution, and retail sale timing. Um, very, very nice corns and have the highest probably sh pure sugar you know, taste of any of these genetic types. But the uh, the seeds sometimes can be hard to plant for an average gardener because they're a little bit they're shrunken and they're not real consistent in size there and or shape or shape yeah yeah even even our commercial guys that uh, that we work with quite closely struggled sometimes with planting these mainly because of their irregularity yeah. um, they have a very small uh, endosperm so they don't that uniform corn shape you're used to seeing uh, is just not doesn't exist with them uh, however you know that that uh, has gotten significantly better over time. The genetics now, the, the things that commercial growers are using now, are significantly better than the stuff that was uh, available 10 or 15 years ago when Super Sweets first started to get in the marketplace. Now these seeds are going to cost you more money because they're better 
see there's more investment been put into the breeding part of it. The growing of the seed, the quality of the seed's a lot better because it's held to a lot higher standards of testing than some of these older varieties. So just keep in mind, as we move up this right here, you're gonna be looking at a higher cost of seed count. That's just, that's just nature of it, the way it is. And uh, if you consider yourself a pretty decent corn grower, you definitely should be giving some of these a, a try there. Now I'm gonna name off some of the varieties that fit this SH2. Seminole XR, Glacier, obsession devotion jubilee and passion and by all means obsession is the most popular out of that yeah right now obsession right. is probably the most widely grown individual sweet corn variety in the country yeah. probably really not close um most of your retailers are pretty much uh, handle only by color now i think probably most people listening are used at some point in their life saw white or yellow corn at the grocery store but it has consolidated around by color now almost almost everywhere in the U.S. And the devotion is a, is a white. Is a white. Now, some people's gonna argue this fact, but is there a difference in the color of the corn compared to the taste of it? Not based on color. Okay. Um, it, these are differences between varieties, even within super sweet varieties, yes. But is that based on color? No. Yeah. The one thing about super sweets as a home gardener though, is they cannot be cross-pollinated with any other genetic type. Which is good. Which is good. I mean, generally speaking, if you're going to do SH2 types, you either need to plant only SH2 types or give yourself enough isolation to prevent cross-pollination to other genetic types, either SEs or... And you'd be surprised at the people that's home gardeners who want to plant more than one variety. I don't really understand that because I normally just plant one variety in springtime. Now, I get the field corn thing. I get that. But for sweet corns there, a lot of people want to try different stuff. We have customers all the time, oh, I'm going to plant this, then I'm going to wait and plant that. Well, give yourself a, a window there of st staggering it so it don't tassel at the same time. That'll yeah. take care of that problem as well. Generally two weeks is the mark we use. Right. All right, so now we're going to move into something that's a little bit different. We don't see a lot of these. These are the augmented super sweets. This is the SHA. And this is not real popular, but there's some of them out there, so I feel like we need to talk about a little bit. Now these can find multiple gene types on the same cob. Correct. Such as SH2. Uh, these varieties are 100% of the kernels containing the SH2 gene, but also have the SE and the SU genes in some portion of the kernels. So you get a collage of those different type kernels mm -hmm. with these, uh, these ones right here. They don't do good for mechanical picking, which is not an issue for most of our home Mainly gardeners. because they're too soft. They're too soft. And, uh, but they seem to have real tender kernels. And uh, as with any other sweet corns, these varieties must be isolated from the SUs, SEs, and SYs to keep from cross-pollinating, mm -hmm. if you want to keep them two of there. Now, three of these names, these are here, is Navarna. Navarna, am I saying that right? Navarna, Nirvana, yeah. Yellowstone and Eden, with some of the lesser known varieties, but it's definitely uh, definitely some a lot of people like to plant out there. Now this last category here, they seem to be more more popular, and these are what we call the synergistic S Y. All right, these synergistic varieties combine different genetics on the same area as well. The first varieties developed these type have 25% of SH2. I know this can get confusing here. 25% of SH2, 25% of SE, and 50% of the SU kernels on the cob, but now different combinations are possible. These, uh, let me get my glasses on here. There's an increase in number of brand names and trademarks that cover specific genetic com uh, combinations under this right here. A common trait of all these right here is that isolation from other SU and SE varieties pollinating at the same time is not required. Though isolation may still be recommended for maximum uh, sweetness. Now I'm gonna name off some of the varieties right here. It's Honey Slick, temp temper Temptress, Serendipity, Primus, Avalon, and Providence. Have you ever grown any of those? I've never grown any of those. They're not, they're not able to be grown in the commercial space, really. Honey Slick, I grew probably three or four years ago. Oh man, it was really sweet. Boy, it was sweet. It was so much different than what we used to be growing in the past. I didn't went real crazy about it. It was almost like candy. It was so yeah. sweet there. Uh, it grew out fine. I did wonderful with it. But the flavor of that, but we weren't crazy about it. But 
somebody that's never had some of the other type that grew up on it would actually love the younger generation oh, yeah. because it's so sweet. Yeah, these are fairly predominant in roadside stand production in Midwest and Northeast. They're, right. They're an increasing part of that 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 business. Serendipity. Seen it. Don't know much about it, but yep. I've seen it. Yep. The honey Avalon's a white, correct? Avalon's a white. The honey slate's a yellow. And Providence is a yellow. Yep. Yep. So those are some good ones right there that you may want to try there. You know, try it, see if you like it. If you got some people that never eat much of the Silver Queen, they're probably going to love it. It's very different, for sure. What what where do you tend to be on your on what you prefer as far as a home garden? What would what's your choices there? I think it really depends on what um, what you're trying to do. If you're uh, we've only put up the super sweet types, but some of that's because there there are genetics and I have access to them. Um, I've eaten a lot of I've eaten enough synergistic stuff to know it's good. Yeah, right. Um, it's very good. I there's very little SE and SU1 grown anymore. I probably wouldn't grow those um, mainly because it gives you zero flexibility on when you, when and how you put it up. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to kind of do it when the corn's ready, not when you're ready. The super sweet types, the synergistic types, they give you enough flexibility uh, in terms of schedule. If you're if you're a working person and you, you can only put corn up on the weekend, but your corn is ready on a Monday or Tuesday, and maybe you can harvest it but can't process it, the super sweets and the, the uh, synergistic types are going to give you the best chance of putting a good product in the freezer or in the but You know, one thing that I've noticed, too, on some of these, especially the SH2 varieties, there's a lar larger harvest window. That's the whole point. The, yeah. the, the harvest window, of course, not only do they the store, window. but their harvest window is a lot They have zero conversion to starch. So mm -hmm. every other type on here that contains either SU or S SU1 or SE kernels, that conversion to starch starts immediately after you pull the ear. Right. The super sweet types, that conversion never happens. So they will, they will decay actually still being sweet. That makes sense. They never convert their, their sugars to starch in the kernel. On these SH2s, I've seen as long as up to 10 days as far as the harvest window there, if the oh, weather's yeah. right. Yeah, I think, I think the, 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 with all these sweet corns, if you err, err on the side of being late than early. Because there's nothing worse than harvesting an ear of sweet corn that's not sweet, and most right. of the time that's because you've harvested it too early. Right. Um, that's the other beauty of the super sweet types is if you have to wait till the next week to process the corn, because uh, you don't want to harvest it early, they will hold uh, longer uh, in the field and in the and in the core or in the refrigerator or wherever you're storing them. Yeah, you got a little different uh, flavor profile with those. Uh, uh, probably more sugar, less mm -hmm. corn. Right. Um, than the other types. If you go back to the SU1s, it's more corn, less sugar. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to the, the synergistic or augmented, it's sort of a blend of that. But as you go up the scale of, of, of uh, genetics in terms of uh, the super sweets, you lose more corn, you gain more sweet. So the end of the day, folks, if you're just starting out growing corn, maybe start out with some of the cheaper seed type varieties, Silver Queen, things like that. It's going to be very, very expensive to buy those seeds there. Start with those. Very forgiving. If you're an experienced corn grower or, or you think you get it now, Pat, by all means, try to move on up to some of these SH2s or, or some of these synergistic type varieties. I think you, I've never heard nobody switch to them that backed off of them. No, the conversion, uh, the conversion at home farm stands, roadside stands is 100% now. Yeah. You've pretty much seen no SEs, no SU1s grown right. by any sort of commercial producer anymore. It just, to, not a flexibility in those genetic types for, for anyone that's in the commercial space. So what about isolation? Right, so some of you guys that are growing field corn and you're growing your sweet corn, you do have to worry about cross-pollination between sure. the sweet corn. And, and this information I got right here, we got off the UGA site. I believe you sent me the article mm -hmm. on that right there. So I'm going to read this to you. Isolation is necessary to maintain kernel sweetness and color. All sweet corn varieties should be isolated from field corn by 250 feet or 14 days difference in pollen shed, and that means tasseling. Isolate shrunken two varieties from standard and sugar enhanced types to minimize starchy kernels. Why would you want to plant them if you're going to plant them together and they're going to cross pollinate? Yep. So that's the good reason to uh, keep them isolated. While isolation of sugar enhanced from standard types is not necessary, it does ensure full, full expression of the different sweetness characteristics of the variety. 
So there you have it folks, 250 feet or 14 days in tassel. As you mentioned, we'll go two weeks. Two weeks, yeah, it's a pretty standard rule. Yep. All right, folks, there you have it, corn. Got to grow corn. You'll, you'll be so proud that you did. If you got room for it, get it under control. Now, one thing I need to mention here is water requirements. When that corn goes to tasseling, Make sure it's good. Make sure you got plenty of water to it. If you ever see that, that leaf twist up, you've waited too long. We were using drip tape last few years, and I don't ever let my corn twist. You know, that leaf twist around right there. Don't do it. So, uh, and when it's, when it's tasseling, man, we keep it wet because you want that ear to fill out there at that point. Yeah, one of the common questions I'll get is about tillering the side shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, and should you go in and prune those off? And No. Uh, right. Actually, I think for most home gardeners, farm stand people, they leave them because that, that tiller will produce a produce a, um, a, a tiller or produce a seed head or a flower head, sorry, a tassel, and that will provide additional pollen. So unless it just gets too far out of hand, I generally tell people don't worry about just leave it alone. Don't worry about tillers. Just leave them on the plant. You know, we, we always get these questions during corn time where they don't fill out the detail. They maybe just fill out. What, what's the most common problem with that, do you think? Well, there's several. If, if it's a tip issue, a lot of times you've had a corn earworm that snipped that, that last tassel or last silk. So the silks emerge from the bottom up. So the last silks to emerge are the silks are for the tip from of the, the top. ear. Yep. Uh, and so either your pollen's no longer there, it's gone, or you've had insect damage to those silks that won't allow the, the pollen to, to go down and, and, and fertilize. Any number of things like that. It's, it's, it's generally something related to the silk itself, whether there was either no pollen got to the silk or the silk was damaged somehow. Or stress to the plant somewhat. Yeah, and all your modern genetics have been selected aggressively for tip, what we call tip fill. So they're capable of doing it, the, the genetics are such. So if there's not tip fill, it's generally either mechanical or some kind of insect damage that's caused it. Hmm. All right, so let's move on to the garden spot of the week. Don't you look at there. And that's a turnip or rutabaga. That's a rutabaga, I think. And he didn't say, this is from Alan Hudson, Skidmore, Texas. Now, Alan didn't tell us what this was, or I didn't get the memo, but I think that's rutabagas. But that's some huge rutabagas right there. I grew some about half that size in my garden. So no, no chance of sugar beets. I don't like sugar beets. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's rutabagas. It's big enough to be sugar beets. Have you ever eaten the leaves of rutabagas? I have not. They are delicious. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes. We'll if that. you've never tried the leaves on rutabagas, you'll be what have I been? Missing all my life. But thank you, Alan, for sending that in. Skidmore, cool. Texas. All right, folks, the old goat figurine is on the set somewhere. Well, we can't tell you where it's at, but it's on the set in its, in it's head. But if you find it, put it in the comments below, and next week we'll be doing a drawing for this week's winner. But today we're doing a drawing for last week's winner, and it is Elizabeth Reynolds. Elizabeth, send us your shipping information to CussServe at HossTools.com and we will get you a highly coveted pair of socks. Look at there. Oh, mm -hmm. Man, can you imagine wearing those around with your Bermuda shorts on around at the beach? You'd be the envy of the night. I can Bermuda. imagine it, yes. <laughs> Folks, there you have it. You get dirty socks. Send us in your old goat and we'll get you a pair of those right there out and you'll be the envy of the neighborhood. All right, folks, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Sweet Corn. Now, it's, let's talk about time for just a quick now. Now's the time to be getting ready where we live. In zone nine, we're in zone nine now. You believe yeah, that? You're, you're probably planting our close to we're it. Plant, I'm going to plant mine within the next two weeks because temperature, uh, some of these seed corn can be a little bit uh, sensitive to cold soils. Ideally 70 plus. So we want to let our soils warm up a little bit and we're going to plant ours. Now I'm going to plant mine in two weeks. It's going to be around the 15th of March. When will you plant yours? Or uh, when will we be planting in your area? Uh, for the most part, guys will plant after the 15th of April. Which is May 1st. what part of North Carolina? We're zone seven. Zone seven. So y'all about a month off from us. Almost a complete month back. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So we get ready to plant your sweet corn. I think you'd be glad you did. You'll have plenty to eat, share with your neighbors, and you'll have plenty to preserve and put up. Thank y'all for joining us. Thank you, Peter, for Thank joining you. us. Yep. Now it's time for you to get outside and get dirty. <laughs>